Today we're going to go over how to set up your sizing die for proper setback and go over some of the various details that are involved in setting up your sizing die. Some of the things that you're going to need I have laid out here. So I've got my Imperial sizing wax. Obviously you can use the lubrication of your choice. I really like the Imperial wax. I've got a little Q-tip here, my sizing die and its lock ring, a hex wrench so I can adjust that lock ring. I've got a six dasher case that's been fire formed and that's the case we're going to be working with when setting up this die. I have a headspace gauge. Well, this little guy attaches to your caliper and one of these will typically ship in each wooden custom die set. And then of course I have my uh, caliper here. So these are, these are most of what you're going to need to get this uh, done and we're going to go over how to set up this die and we'll be doing that in a Forster press. So keep in mind that those of you that are using traditional presses, um, when you're adjusting the lock ring, that'll be just slightly different. But otherwise, the principles here and how you set this die up are going to be the same. We'll start out with an anatomy lesson of the various parts of a metallic cartridge case. And this is pretty universal throughout all different types of, of brass. Uh, you'll have some that are straight wall, but for a bottleneck case, this is typically how it goes. Uh, we have a mouth, which is right up on the end here. The case neck, which is right through here. The neck shoulder junction, which is the point where the neck and the shoulder of the case meet. And the shoulder, obviously, is this portion here. And then you've got the shoulder body junction, which is right here. And then you've got the case body which extends down through here. And once you get into this region here, that's typically called the case web. Uh, now, this very back portion of the case web is typically unsupported. Uh, much of this uh, little area back here will, will actually protrude from the back of the chamber. And you do need the very back portion of this to hang out so that you can get the extractor of your bolt over top of the groove here and again there's some variation on this depending on what uh, cartridge you're using in the case of a flat rimmed cartridge well then it'd be slightly different but we've got a normal rimmed case here and the rim then is typically what you'd see through here and the base of the case is the very bottom portion of the case here and then of course in the bottom you've got your primer pocket and we have fired this case, so there is a spent primer in the primer pocket presently. Um, that's the general idea and the general anatomy of a cartridge case. There's some very specific things that you could drill down into, but for our purposes here, we'll just simply be using those terms. Now, the next term we're going to talk about is headspace. Headspace is the measurement from the shoulder to the very bottom base of the case. The headspace on the cartridge case corresponds to the headspace in the chamber that this case was fired in. Now, if you're doing things properly on the first firing of your brass, you will either have the bullet jammed into the lens effectively and uh, have and or have the uh, spring-loaded extractor removed or whatever you need to do to make sure that the base of this case is up against the bolt face when you fire it. That will allow all of your brass growth to happen up here where it's supposed to. So when you get a piece of virgin brass, the headspace or the measurement from the shoulder to the base of the case is often short and it's short to make sure that it will chamber in everybody's rifle. But in some cases, it can be very short. In the case of fire forming, the original shoulder dimension was uh, significantly lower. Here you can see a six millimeter BR case that was used to form this dasher brass on the top. The original shoulder mark, you can actually physically see that in the formed brass 
of the dasher is where the shoulder used to be on that case. So it's important when you're doing the first firing on your brass or if you're doing any fire forming for a wildcat like you see here that the brass be pushed all the way up against the bolt face down here on the head of the brass. You, you need this base to be all the way against the bolt to ensure that any brass growth happens up here where it's supposed to. Uh, this area of the brass down through here is much more brittle. It's harder and it's thicker and does not respond well to heavy expansion and contraction. Whereas up here it is thin and it's been tempered appropriately so that you have a much easier time with expansion and contraction. After all, that is its job. You're supposed to resize this, uh, shrink the diameter of your case neck, and that will allow the bullet to stay in there when you seat the bullet. And then when you fire it, it subsequently expands to fit the chamber, which there's clearance provided, and will then allow the bullet to be released, and you'll have to size it again before you can load another bullet. So it's important to remember this process because during the setup of our sizing die, we're going to want to ensure that all of this is working properly. And by taking measurements throughout the entire process, we can determine exactly what kind of workload is being applied to our brass. This headspace measurement, the measurement from the shoulder to the base of the case, is a very important thing to get a lock on. And that is where this headspace gauge comes in. Uh, applying this to your caliper jaws will allow you to get a measurement from the shoulder datum, which is somewhere along this shoulder to the base of the case. Now the diameter of your headspace gauge, you can see this is a hole in the bottom here, the diameter of that, they have recommendations, and of course Widen, when they send a custom die set, they'll send the correct diameter for the cartridge that you've ordered the die set for. But Hornady and Sinclair and various other companies have a headspace gauge that works with the various comparator bodies that you'd get for a bullet comparator set. So you can insert one of these little headspace gauges into the bottom of your bullet comparator and, and use that as well. I like these little standalone ones here that come with wooden dies. So uh, I've ordered a ton of wooden dies, and I've got just a whole pile of these things laying around. So I just took a set of those, outfitted them with thumb screws uh, so that I can take them on and off easily. Now you must have a headspace gauge like this in some variety in order to properly set up your sizing die. Because how far we screw that sizing die down will determine just how much pressure we put on this shoulder and set it back. Now you've heard this term before most likely, the amount of setback that we have. When we go to set up our sizing die, we will be setting the amount of setback based on how much pressure we put on this shoulder. The inside of our sizing die will have a shape very similar to this, albeit slightly smaller. So the sizing die is going to squeeze our neck diameter down and it's going to squeeze the body down, specifically uh, this area here of the body, and just above and right down to that case web area, uh, it will be squeezing that diameter down smaller so that whatever expansion we had, we can get it small enough so that it will be able to be effortlessly inserted back into our chamber once we load it again. So this, this measurement right here uh, the rest of these are largely a consequence of the, the sizing die itself. Whatever diameters were specified in the creation of the die is the diameter that this stuff's going to come out. But the headspace, the measurement between the shoulder and the base of the case, how much setback we have, is largely a function of how we set the sizing, uh, the sizing die up in our press. If we screw the die down further, it's going to squeeze that headspace back uh, and do a lot more setback. If we uh, leave it long, well then it may not do any setback at all and allow the brass to re remain out here full length. If you squeeze this too much, then this area of the brass, and usually you'll find it'll happen right down here, 
will become very stressed. And because you cannot anneal down here toward the base or web of the case, uh, if you annealed this, you'd lose the hardness of the brass and it wouldn't be able to hold the charge anymore. And when it receives the pressure from the firing event, it will literally just explode. So the brass, its job is to be a balloon and hold all that pressure in our chamber. And if you squeeze this body too much, you apply pressure here, and because that shoulder is flared out, it'll transfer all of that stress down to the most brittle point in the brass, which is typically down here, where the brass is the hardest. Now, suffice it to say, I'm not going to get into a huge in interior ballistics discussion here. Uh, I just mainly want to educate you on some of the things to consider when setting up these dies. If you squeeze that down too much, during the next firing event, the brass will then expand forward. And if you have a spring-loaded ejector in there, the brass will be pushed forward away from the bolt face at however much room it has to go forward here in front of the shoulder and or however much room the extractor will allow it to go forward, which in some cases can be quite a lot, 20 thousandths, 30 thousandths, um, and that will cause the brass to grab a hold of the chamber up here and it will expand back here. And when it expands back here, you will have a case head separation. And that's where the brass will literally be sheared off back here on the case web. And the bottom of the brass will become separated from the front of the brass. So you'll have everything from here forward stuck in your chamber. And you'll eject this little stub, which is the base of your case, out the side. Not a good situation. And improperly setting up a sizing die is the number one cause of case head separation that I have seen. In order to properly set our die up, we first need to take a measurement of some of our fired brass. So I'm going to install our headspace gauge. So I zero out the caliper here with the headspace gauge on, and then I grab five fired cases. Now you'll notice here that there's a primer sticking out the bottom of these. Before you can adequately measure your headspace, you have to make sure that that primer is out of there. If you do not do this, then it's very likely that any of your uh, primer deformation, if you have a little bit of firing pin cratering, or if the primer itself has backed out of the case ever so slightly, it will interfere with your base to shoulder, your actual headspace measurement. So it's important to get that primer out of there before you do any of this. One really easy way to accomplish this is to just run the decapping assembly way out the bottom of your die so that the decapping assembly is sticking way out the bottom and will contact that primer before you ever start to size any of your case. You definitely do not want to run the case all the way down. All we're doing here is just knocking the primer out. Once we've decapped a few pieces of brass and got that primer out of the way, we want to make sure that the uh, lock ring on this die is nice and loose and uh, that we can run the die up and, up and down through the lock ring very easily. And we want to remove the decapping assembly entirely. We want to be able to feel where this brass is contacting inside there as easily as possible. And uh, this extra piece of equipment here comes in handy later, but for right now we'll just get in the way. So for the time being, we'll just work with the body of the die, and uh, this is what's going to be doing our setback, and, and this is the uh, adjustment that we need to use to set how far that setback is. The threads on here are fairly rough, so it does not take very much movement here to cause your, your vertical adjustment to uh, go a long, a long ways. A thousandth of, of an inch is literally about like that much movement. Uh, it's very small amount of adjustment. There are, uh, Widen does sell dies that have some notches in them that will click and give you an audible indicator of how much you're moving the die. Those are pretty cool. Uh, I do not have a bunch of those sets, but uh, that is an option. Uh, otherwise, you can basically just count on this being a, a trial and error type thing. Now, it helps to 
put a little Sharpie marker in relation to some geography like this slot here. You can put a Sharpie mark up here on the thread somewhere and you can have a, a more relative adjustment. Our next step here is just to measure a few cases and record exactly where they are in relation to headspace. So I'll grab a few of them here and you insert the case and then just kind of spin it while applying very light pressure with the caliper. And we have a one, two, four, eight. So that's one inch and 248 thousandths. Our next piece is one, two, four, eight and a half. Our next piece is one, two, four, eight. One, two, four, eight again. And one, two, four, eight and a half. So we've got a very, very good form on the on this brass here. All pieces are within a half of a thousandth or five ten thousandths. And uh, that is beyond what this caliper can accurately measure. In order to measure that kind of tolerance, you would need a micrometer and a, a very good one at that. Now these calipers are very good, but they can still only be trusted down to the thousandth. And uh, they struggle there even. Uh, anybody that uh, has any experience in machining will tell you that when you get beneath a couple of thousands, three thousandths or so, you're definitely going to want to switch over to a micrometer. But for our purposes in setting this die up, the calipers will suffice. The better of a set you have, like these Michitoyos here, uh, and I'll put the link to these things in the uh, video description so you know exactly what model I'm using and where to go get them. So get yourself a good caliper. You're going to need it throughout your, your entire reloading process in one capacity or the next, and they are definitely worth the money. I think these Michitoyos here are about $180 to $200, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, and that's an 8 inch set. Now there is one uh, variable to consider throughout all of this and that is whether or not this fired piece of brass right here will chamber in my rifle presently. Because in most cases you can take your fired brass and insert it right back in your chamber and it will go in there. So the amount of setback that you're going to provide needs to at least account for that variable. If you can chamber this right now, then you know that it's close. Now in the case of this brass, and this is pretty common when fire forming, it has been blown forward and it's a pretty drastic amount of brass movement, and the brass, I can feel it just ever so slightly um, kind of binding up in the action there. I mean, I can, I can obviously close the bolt and, and I can chamber it just fine, but as you may have seen in a previous video on uh, the measuring your length to the lands, if you're setting up your, your brass here, it's not a bad idea to do, do that same process. Re remove the ejector plunger uh, and remove the firing pin assembly so that there's nothing binding on the bolt and check whether or not any of these fired cases can be reinserted into your chamber. If you feel, as I feel with this particular a six millimeter dasher, a slight bit of resistance, then you know that you're right at the very edge of your tolerance. And how much to set the brass back is going to depend upon the relationship of this brass and how closely it's formed to your chamber. In the case of this brass here being a basically a friction fit with my present chamber, meaning that I can get it in there and it's fine, but it's right at the very edge. I'm going to set it back a little farther than I would normally. And I'm going to maintain that level of setback throughout the subsequent firings of my brass. As you get firings on the brass, it will change ever so slightly in terms of how much spring back it will give you and what kind of dimension it'll actually take after firing. So knowing what I know about all that and my experience with all of that, I'm going to set these things back approximately two thousandths of an inch. Anywhere between um, a thousandth or a half a thousandth, um, a thousandth is what I consider to be minimum. 
uh, much less than that, and you're going to have variances in brass show up, and, and you'll be out shooting, and all of a sudden, one of them will kind of bind up on you when you go to chamber it. So I'd recommend a minimum of one thousandth setback. A thou and a half is really good. And anywhere up to maybe four thousandths is what I consider to be adequate. If you get much over four or five thousandths of setback, then what we spoke about earlier, introducing stress into the body of the case and setting yourself up for a case head separation is a very likely event. So anywhere between one and a half thousandths and four thousandths at the very most is what I would like when I'm getting my die set up to set these things back. So I have my wooden die in the press here and just for the sake of science and demonstration, I'm going to screw this die down until it contacts the shell holders. So right there, I've got firm contact on my, on my shell holders. Uh, on many factory dies, such as those provided by Redding or Forster or RCBS, they will instruct you to screw it down until it contacts the shell holder on your press. So you can see there that I've got some cam over and it's it's clamping on those uh, uh, shell holders on this Forster press very hard. Um, so the, the die itself will have a great determination of how this headspace gets set. I've screwed the die down all the way here and I'm going to lube up one of these cases with Imperial Wax and then we're going to size a case. And of course I don't have the lock ring set because this is just for demonstration here. And uh, I'm going to size this case and then we're gonna take a headspace measurement. Okay, so there was a lot of pressure there at the end of the cycle and it really shoved this thing back. Uh, so we're gonna take a measurement now of just how much. So this case here was the one that we just resized and it started out with a dimension of 1.248. And when I measure it here, we have a dimension of 1.2355. So that is a lot, okay? If it were to read 1.238, that would be 10 thousandths. And it's shorter than that uh, by 3 thousandths. So we have a total here of around 13 thousandths of setback on this particular piece of brass. And that is definitely way too much, even for a gas gun. Uh, somebody running an AR-15 or some kind of semi-automatic, I would still never recommend more than about five or six thousandths of setback, and we have twice that in this piece of brass. So for all intents and purposes, this piece of brass is ruined. I will never get as many firings out of this brass as I would another because of the stress that I have placed in this area of the case right here. Now having said that, if I did want to rescue it as much as possible, I could fire form this in my chamber again by leaving a bullet seated long and jamming that bullet into the lands as well as removing my extractor, or excuse me, my uh, ejector plunger, and keep the base of this case against the bolt face, then it would expand back out the top and I should be able to rescue that case. But we're just gonna throw it away because I've got a lot of these. <laughs> so now you know what happens uh, if you set your die too deep you can crush a case, and in the case of certain dies, depending on how deep that chamber is set in there, if the chamber is set very short in the die and you screw it down to the shell holder, you can smush one really bad. So be careful of that. I've grabbed a new case now, and this is the one that we're actually going to start working with. Uh, the demonstration of, of crushing the case and getting too short a headspace. We've already done that. So we've got one here that measures one, two, four, eight, five. So we'll use this brass to set this die up properly now. I'm gonna unscrew this die a long ways and make sure it's not making any contact. Now I'm going to lube up, just take some Imperial wax on my fingers and get a nice even coat of a very light and even coat of lubrication on this case. It's just barely damp with the stuff. That's an easy way to do this, is you can back the die out until you can raise the rim without it touching, and then 
Of course, in the case of a normal press, right, you would just have this lock ring floating there and you can hold it and just screw it in. So I screw it in until I'm making contact. So right there is where I'm making contact. I know I need to go significantly more than that. So we're going to put two full turns on the die. So from here, I am definitely feeling pressure and we are definitely doing some work to this brass. And this is the idea, you just want to sneak up on this thing until you're getting a, a good portion of the neck sized. And you'll be able to see that very plainly. So we'll zoom in here and give you a look. So you can see very plainly on the neck of this case that we have sized just about half of the neck. So this diameter is smaller up here and we are sizing, we have yet to size the bottom half of the neck, but this up here has been sized. So we want to keep an eye on that location as we keep moving through the sizing process. Okay, we're getting a good portion of that neck sized now. A good portion indeed, so it's almost right down to the shoulder junction there. And as the die squeezes this brass together, it will make it longer. If you were to measure the overall length on this case, it will grow two to five thousandths just because you're squeezing the diameter and it is moving up. So based on the position of our lock ring right now, I'm going to measure the headspace on this to see how close we are to our original 1.248 adjustment. Now, we started at 1.248 and we are at 1.2495. So you can see that this brass has grown. And that's because we're squeezing the outside diameter. The body of the case is getting squeezed. The neck of the case is getting squeezed and therefore it is going out the top. And that's very cool, and that's why I prefer full length dies that don't have any bushings in them, because the brass can only go one way, out. And there's no juncture between a bushing and the case, it can only go out the top. So any deficiencies can be trimmed off at the mouth later. So we're going to take a much slower approach now that we're getting the full neck sized on this thing and I'm going to turn my die and get this lock ring locked down because as I close this lock ring down on these threads it's going to change my dimension ever so slightly so I want to lock this thing down to make sure that the die and the lock ring are one piece now and I'm going to run this down again and we'll take another measurement. Okay, so we're, we're definitely still not there. So now we're gonna loosen that lock ring and I'm gonna keep a very firm purchase on that lock ring with my finger. Okay, right there it should be loose enough for me to move. And now I'm going to tighten this thing ever so slightly. Oop, didn't get that lock ring loose enough. You don't want the lock ring moving a large degree separate from the die, so you just kind of hold it with your finger there, and then I'm going to make my adjustment. Okay, so the tiniest adjustment, and then lock it back down. And we'll run this up into the die again. And you keep doing this until you see this number get just a little shorter. And we're not going for a huge bump here. We're going for just a very small bump. So I'm going to keep moving it the tiniest little bit at a time until I get my desired measurement out of this case. Now it may be necessary to relubricate the case as you go. Okay, so we pulled a half a thousandth out of it right there. 
I'm gonna re-lubricate this case. It's getting just a little dry here. And I'm going to make another tiny adjustment. I could feel very plainly the press cam over on that last adjustment. So it's certainly putting pressure on that shoulder because moving that shoulder back is infinitely more, it takes infinitely more power to do that than it does to just squeeze this brass uh, through an open space. Okay, so there's firm contact there. I am definitely setting this thing back. So we'll see if I went too much or if I've got it right on the nose. Okay. So we're at 1.248 right there. So we're back to our original measurement and we've established that I want it to go another couple of thousandths beyond that point. Now that we've got pressure taking the slack out of our die and our press and our shell holder and everything else, we want to make sure that we get the proper squeeze. So I'm going to go a tiny little adjustment. I went just a little bit more there because of that pressure now is going to be taking the slack out of our press mechanism. And uh, the more pressure you apply, the more your press and all of its various joints will flex. So I went just a little bit more than I did on the times before. Now I'm going to re-lubricate this case just to make sure that we're not going to get anything stuck. And we'll run it up again. Okay, very firm contact there at the bottom yet. And if we measure the case, 1.475. So this is that brass spring back I was telling you about. And despite making a pretty large adjustment there, we've taken a lot of slack out of our mechanism. We've put actual pressure on all of our various components that are locked together here. And now we need to make another little fine adjustment in the hopes that we can get our desired adjustment made. Okay, one more time. Now we have adequate setback there. And we're down to 1.47. So we've come a thou or a thou and a half, depending on which case we've taken a measurement from. So this last final little adjustment here, we should be able to get where we're going. Now keep in mind while we're working this brass, it is changing. So in order to get our final measurement, we're going to have to take a fresh piece and run it into here one time and see what we get. Because we're not going to want to run every piece through this thing a dozen times. We're going to want to make our adjustments so that when we run all of our pieces through, one time they come out with the correct dimension. Okay, one, two, four, six, five. So that's pretty good. I'm about a thou and a half from um, about two thousandths. This one started out at 1.2485, and uh, so I'm two thousandths essentially short on that one. And that's pretty good. So now I'm gonna take a fresh piece. This is a piece of brass that I haven't done anything with, with yet, except I knocked the primer out. So I'm gonna lube this case up just how I normally would. And we'll run it through one time. And if after that one time we're still close to our adjustment, okay, you see there how that other piece of brass had slightly different dimension? So here, I know that we're going two to two and a half thousandths, depending on the piece. Our longest piece we measured was 1.2485, and the majority of them were 1.248. So that's two thousandths that we've set back from that dimension, based on this case here. And that is perfect. The next step is to put your decapping assembly back in the die, as you can see that I've done here. And you want to run the uh, the main holder here for the decapping rod, run that down, and you can float that 
Um, I've got it tightened up here just for the time being. Sometimes you'll have to insert some rubber washers or just leave this all loose and let it float in there in order to get your run out to be exactly how you want it to be. Uh, that's the subject for another video in the future. For our purposes here today, we're just going to go over how to get your final adjustment on the decapping assembly and your decapping pin down here. You want it to come out the bottom enough to completely dislodge your case, but you don't want the, the expander ball or any other hardware bottoming out on the bottom of your case and ruining your decapping assembly. So what I'm going to do is grab a piece of brass that I have already sized and I'm going to run it up into the die and then one of those last two pieces that I was working with there and I'm going to run that up into the die and once I've got it into the die and keep in mind that these do not have primers in them right now I will run this decapping assembly down until it bottoms out on the inside of the cartridge case so right there is where that is once I get there, I'm going to back it out approximately a full turn and then set my adjustment there. Now, it's going to be hanging out significantly farther than it has to be at that point. A full turn knows that you're completely off of it. You can come back another turn. Uh, it'll still be sticking out enough to make sure that you get a solid decapping process. So I'll grab a fresh piece of brass here with a primer still in it and we'll do a complete run with the capping and all in one stroke just like I normally would. Okay, so there we have a decapped and fully resized piece of brass. I'll just wipe the lube off of it here. And we'll grab our headspace gauge again and check to see how our process looks. And there we are, 1.246, exactly the same as our one prior. So at this point, we know that we're getting the primer knocked out, we're getting a full size, and we're not overworking the brass because we're only setting that shoulder back a couple of thousands. For a field rifle, two thousands, a thou and a half, that's, that's really good. Um, you don't really want much more than a thou and a half, and like I say, anywhere between uh, a thou and a half or four thousandths is just fine. The tighter tolerance that you leave that, um, the less tolerant of dirt and grime and debris and everything else your rifle's going to be. So should you get some crud on your ammo, you won't be able to chamber it and you'll get that thing stuck in your chamber. Uh, so you want to make sure that you leave enough tolerance to have it work in the field, but you want to keep the tolerance close enough so that you're not overworking your brass. You can see here I made a note, and this is important, uh, good record keeping is very important in the reloading process. We started at 1.248 was my short measurement on the pieces of brass that I had measured, and then we wanted to go for 1.246, so I wrote that down, and then after I confirmed that where the die was set up, we were hitting that measurement, I just circled it. That tells me that when I go to Gunhive and put in my headspace measurement, that's what I want my brass to measure out at. 1.246. So anytime I'm working with this rifle in the future, I know that I can use this number as a guide with uh, any of the brass that'll fit in that chamber that the outside headspace dimension cannot be longer than that if I really want to make sure that it's going to operate smoothly in the rifle. Now, these numbers cannot be shared amongst people on the internet. They can be as a rough guideline, but the diameter of this particular headspace gauge, and I mean this individual one that I'm holding in my hand right here, is what determines the length of the measurement we're taking. So this measurement is only good for me using this exact number, uh, this exact unique headspace gauge that I'm holding in my hand. Now you see it says that it's a 350 thousandths diameter hole, but it isn't as if I grabbed a pin gauge or something and measured that hole. And then the chamfer on the very outside of the hole, that can change uh, my dimension ever so slightly. So you have to use a specific gauge with a specific cartridge in a, a specific rifle when setting up these dies. And uh, this one here, I will know in the future that I used my Widen 350 thousandths um, headspace gauge 
So uh, do not listen to numbers that you see on the internet uh, other than just a very rough guide. You have to take these measurements using your own equipment with your own headspace gauge and uh, that's the only way this is going to work. Now that we've established our headspace, let's take a look and see whether or not this die is working our brass too much or not. So I've got a couple of pieces of fired brass over here and I decapped these earlier and these have not been run through the die at all yet. They are fire formed straight from my chamber. These three pieces of brass here are ones that we just ran through the die in one capacity or the next. Now some of these have been run through a lot whereas the other two have only been run through one time. Um, now, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this one with all the shiny marks on it has been through there a lot. So we're just going to set him aside. These two, however, have just been run through one time each. So this fired case, I'm going to take some measurements. And you can do this with a micrometer and get an even better measurement. But the neck diameter on this fired case is 1.2 or excuse me, uh, 0.272, so 272 thousandths. Whereas the neck diameter on one of my sized cases is running 266 here. Now I wonder, was this the one that I used the decapping assembly on? Did an expander ball come through here? We'll try this other one and see. 261. So this one very clearly did not get expanded. This one was just neck sized essentially. Uh, this one here with the larger dimension being noted had the expander ball drug back through it. And we're getting a few thousandths larger measurement. So the reason it's important to do this is you can see exactly what's happening during the course of the work with your brows. So we take our fired piece here and we're at 270 thousandths on this one. And this one, we are at 272. So there's some variation in spring back in the uh, case necks on those pieces, no doubt. And if we take this one here, 266, this one without the expander is 262. So we can see here that the case neck is being sized to approximately 261. Um, 261 and a half, 262, right? It's it's being squeezed down to around 260, 261, 260 and a half, and then the brass has some spring back, so it's being squeezed down, let's say to 260, and then there's some expansion, maybe a thou, thou and a half of expansion of brass spring back. So that brings our final diameter to 261. So we're starting at 270, right? We've got these fired pieces around 270 to 272, and it's being squeezed approximately 10 thousandths. And then after the expander ball is drugged through it, it is opening up another four to six thousandths. So that is very typical of what you'll see on many custom die sets. And then you can specify in the dimension of the neck when you're ordering the custom die set exactly how much it's being squeezed. So this is a very good die set. We're only getting a total element of about ten thousandths of movement. The expander ball is only expanding around four to six thousandths of material which is not very much and you're typically going to have a very well performing die in, in that instance. Now, if you go with smaller numbers, you lose a bit of your tolerance when it comes to the brass. I like to oversize my necks a little bit, and you can go as much as maybe 15 thousandths before you're going to start having problems, but I like to stay right around 10 for a total sizing of the neck. Now, I anneal my cases. I anneal from here up. Uh, every single firing. So I'm not worried about split necks and that's the only thing that you're really going to have happen if you overwork that portion of your brass is the neck will get a split in it and that brass will be trashed at that point 
So 10 thousandths allows me to squeeze it down enough to where I know that the brass is not going to spring back larger than my expander ball. And then my expander ball is going to drag back through there and give me a proper internal neck diameter so that I have enough room when I go to seat my bullet and it'll have adequate tension on it. I have here a loaded case and we've got a bullet seated in here. I shouldn't say it's loaded. This is one of the dummy rounds from a previous video. And I've got a 107 Match King seated properly in here. And if I measure the loaded case diameter, I end up with 268, 268 thousandths. So that means If I look at some rough numbers here that I wrote down, our fired brass in the chamber is measuring 270 to 272 thousandths. Sized is going to be measuring out at 262 plus or minus. By the time we size it and use our expander ma mandrel inside the, the decapping assembly of the die, that brings us to an external diameter, an external neck diameter of 266. Our loaded round is at 268. So if we subtract 266 from 268, that gives us two thousandths of neck tension. Quote, quote, neck tension. Uh, now, neck tension is a infinitely more complex issue than most people will ever give credit. The diameter of the neck does not decide how much squeeze is on that bullet. All that is is a relative number that lets us know that the diameter of this is smaller than the diameter of the bullet that we are sticking in the end of it. And as long as we have some tension there, that bullet will be held in place. Now there's a lot of debate around this. How much neck tension should we have? Well, the amount of neck tension is determined by what kind of surfaces on the bullet, what kind of surfaces on the inside of the neck, how thick this neck material is what the composition, and I mean the actual brass alloy that was used to create the brass. Um, this is an infinitely complex issue and one that we're not going to get into for this particular video. I may do a video in the future about that, but for our intents here, we just want to make sure that this number isn't too small. Because if you're expanding the neck with the bullet during seating, that's going to create some problems. Now, two thousandths, two and a half, three thousandths, even four thousandths, that's no big deal. Um, I like to be somewhere from two to four thousandths of neck diameter from my loaded round measurement. So we are right on spec here with two thousandths, and uh, that is exactly where I like to be. Some further areas of measurement, you can measure around the top of the body of the case. And you can see here that uh, in this particular location, the case expanded to just over 460 thousandths, whereas our sized pieces, we've got about two thousandths, a little over of movement there. Um, you come down here at the case web. Now you wanna be up where the chamber is. You don't wanna be way down on the tip here where the brass isn't hanging out. Now, in some cases that can be valuable to measure, but we'll mainly stay up here on the widest portion of the case. And as you crawl this case down, you'll see that there's very little dimensional change down here at the bottom. Um, as we go down along the body, it'll of course be a narrower measurement. So we'll go to the widest point, which on this seems to be about 469, and that's just right there on the rim, just above the rim. So that's the fired case. If we want to see what our sizing die is doing to that. We can come over here and see that we're getting about that thou to thou and a half worth of worth of adjustment here. So we know that it's doing its job and it's not squeezing too much. There's uh, just the right amount of clearance being created on this fully sized brass and our dimensions are holding and you can grab a, a bunch of different pieces and you can see just how consistently you're able to do this. Now how much lube and how uniform the lube you put on this case and how uniformly you run the press 
is all going to have a bearing on how uniform these measurements turn out. So you want to get into a very good cadence and run your press smoothly and effectively in order to have the most uniform uh, sizing process. I hope you've enjoyed this segment on how to set up your sizing die. It should go without saying here that there is a, a factor of 10 or even 100 times more in depth that you can get on all of these subjects. The brass itself and each component of the brass, each, each area of the brass the various tools that you use for your measurements here, and the uh, metallurgy that goes into the brass, uh, what the chemical, what the uh, compositional makeup of the brass is. It's a very uh, significant alloy in, in modern life, especially for us shooters. Uh, but I can tell you, you should probably do as much research as you can and get as much experience with the finer points of setting up a seating die and, and all of the things that go into it because the more advanced your understanding of this topic is, the uh, more advanced of a rifleman you're going to be able to become. And that's uh, really, there, there's, there's not even a point in debating that because information is power. And in, if you know what your brass is doing, uh, you will have understood a very significant portion of what goes on here uh, in this game that we play with precision rifles. So. Uh, do find as much information as you can, absorb as much as you can, uh, invest in quality components and equipment, and you will tend to find uh, much greater success than if you don't take any of this stuff very seriously. So I hope this has been of some benefit. If you have any questions, feel free to come and post on uh, the subsequent thread on this video, which I'll create here on the forums at gunhive.com, and I look forward to seeing your responses and helping you there.